welcome to City Life. Today on the programme, City Councillor Aaron Kewen on his trip to San Francisco, Spates Coast to Coast stalwart Robin Judkins is in studio, and we catch up with Inspector Dave Lowry. But first on the programme, seismologist Doc. Uh, Dr. John Ristauer, who was working on analysis of the source properties of the Canterbury earthquakes and their aftershocks. Another job you do is to help keep the public informed about the science of the Canterbury earthquakes. Welcome to the program. Uh, oh, thank you. Why did the Christchurch earthquake and the September 2010 Darfield earthquake occur in Canterbury when it's typically a region of relatively low seismic activity? Well, the, in the Canterbury area, um, most of the, the seismic activity typically t does take place further west in the foothills, and then um, you get off towards the Alpine Falls along the west coast. But yeah, um, in the past, the Canterbury Plains had historically been relatively quite um, uh, quiet as, as far as seismic activity goes. Mm. But um, just due to the stresses that kind of that, uh, that build up from the Pacific Plate colliding with the Australian Plate, which uh, the South Island is sitting on. Um, you know, you still get all these stresses that are building up and you have old faults that still exist throughout, uh, throughout the Canterbury Plains that are just, you know, they're, they're buried mm -hmm. and they're, they're hard to map and hard to know where they are. And that's where the Greendale Fault that caused the Darfield earthquake um, mm -hmm. occurred on one of these buried faults. Um, and so, um, you know, these are the... The, the um, earthquakes of that size are actually relatively rare events. You know, they happen maybe every few thousand years, mm. um, that, that, that type of scale. Um, it's just sort of unfortunate that we happen to be around when one actually happened. Mm. So why was it that the February earthquake was much more, more damaging than the September earthquake, although it wasn't as big? Um, well, it has, um, there are several reasons for that. Um, the um, first and foremost, and the most obvious one, is the fact it was much closer to Christchurch mm. than the, than the um, September earthquake was. Um, that one, the September earthquake was about 40 kilometers west of Christchurch, whereas the Christchurch earthquake was um, you know, only about 10 kilometers away and was also a little bit shallower. It also had um, um, the, the property of it that basically that the, that, that the energy that was, re that was released by the earthquake, because when an earthquake happens, um, you know, energy gets um, uh, basically preferentially you know, released in certain directions mm -hmm. where you know, there's a lot of energy in other directions where there's less. And for the Christchurch er earthquake, it was basically directed straight at Christchurch. Mm -hmm. And another big factor um, with the Christchurch earthquake that we had is what we call um, the trampoline effect or slapdown effect, which is um, you have these different layers in um, Christchurch uh, uh, of the ground, you know, soil and, and, uh, and, and rock. Mm. And when the ground started to move up and down, mm. you know, you had the, the top layers, which were weaker, actually separated from the bottom layers. Mm. And then as the bottom layer started to come back down, the top layer is still going back up. Mm. And then the top layer comes back down, the bottom layer is going up, and they just right. slap together like that. Okay. Um, so why was it that the, um, the Christchurch earthquake, the February earthquake, was known as an aftershock? Um, well, uh, you had the um, big earthquake in September, the mm -hmm. 7.1. Mm -hmm. And in seismology terms, when you have um, like a major earthquake like that, you're, you're obviously going to have a lot of aftershocks that, that uh, come after it. And typically the biggest aftershock that you get is about a magnitude unit smaller than the main shock. You know, so about a magnitude six or something like that is mm -hmm. kind of what was expected, anyways, for mm -hmm. the Darfield earthquake. And when he, when when you have a big earthquake, seismologists consider everything that comes after it in, the, in that sort of broad general region to be aftershocks until the seismic activity kind of quiets back down to the level it was before you had the big earthquake. So when the Christchurch earthquake happened, you know, the level of seismic activity was still quite a bit higher than it always was before. Mm. So that's why we consider an aftershock, even though, um, you know, I guess an important point, though, is, is to make still is that um, even though we call it an aftershock, all aftershocks are still earthquakes. So mm. it was an earthquake. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. Oh, that's good to yeah. know. <laughs> How many aftershocks have we had? How long do you think they'll, ha they'll keep going for? Um, well, we've had uh, for, um, since February uh, for the Christchurch one, uh, we have located um, probably somewhere around 2,500 aftershocks. Since February? And, yeah, and wow. since going back to September, since um, the Darfield earthquake, um, I think around 6,800 Something like that. Oh that's gosh. that's something that, that we've located, and there are probably even smaller ones that we um, that that 
that we haven't located. So that's no incredible. One, no one. Yeah, and we can probably still expect them to go on for quite a bit longer. Um, when Darfield happened, we had uh, you know said you know they could go on for a year, maybe even longer, mm. because for major earthquakes like that, that's typically what what you see. Do you think there'll be another big earthquake in Christchurch? Um, well, that's actually that's that's hard to say. You mm. know, but um, um, you know we keep looking at uh, you know we're looking at the data and trying to decide where different areas are going to get more are, um, have, have been uh, where stress has built up, you know, because of these earthquakes mm-hmm. and where other areas where stress has been um, released a bit because of the earthquakes and try and see where they're, um, what, what, what the effects of that is. But it's kind of hard to say. It's actually, you know, pretty much almost possible to say whether there actually will be another big earthquake mm-hmm. or not. Okay. Yeah. What about um, the Christchurch and the Darfield earthquakes? Do you think they will trigger earthquakes anywhere else in New Zealand? Um, well, that is a question. You know, um, you know, people have come up with that, uh, have asked that quite a bit, and um, and large earthquakes like the Darfield earthquakes, they they have been known, you know, to um, trigger other large earthquakes, um, you know, at, at some distance away, um, because when you get um, an earthquake that it, that occurs along a fault, mm. it releases stress along that fault, but it also, that stress doesn't just simply vanish. You know, it just, it gets distributed other places. Mm. So if you get another nearby fault, um, it can actually increase stress on that nearby fault and, and then trigger major earthquake there. So with the Darfield earthquake, one of the first things we um, wanted to know was what effect it had on the Alpine fault. Mm. Um, because yeah. that's always, that fault's a big danger for, mm. um, you know, for the South Island. But uh, um, we quickly found that the Alpine Fault was too far away for the, um, you know, for Darfield to have had any effect on it. Um, so it's not likely that it'll trigger any major earthquakes anywhere else. Okay. You know, particularly anywhere as far uh, away as Wellington or anything like that. No. Okay. What What's the current research that, that GNS is doing at the moment in regard to the Canterbury area? Um, well, right now we're. Um, we're um, doing a lot of intensive studies of the aftershocks, mm. and we're doing a lot of, uh, of accurate uh, relocations of the aftershocks. We get the best knowledge of where all you know, where the aftershocks are occurring, and we can use that data to also get a um, uh, much better idea as to the the structure of the ground underneath. Mm. And um, so we have studies going on at that. We have a lot of work going on with um, with with the GPS sites where we have, uh, you know, the, which measures the very slow um, movement of the earth, you know, that mm. uh, um, you can't see with the human eye, mm. but that happens, you know, in the course of, you know, centimeters per year. And, you know, seeing how, what di- well, how different areas now might, how it uh, might have changed from before Darfield and Christchurch mm. compared to now. Um, moving to a more sort of non-scientific, <clears throat> personal yeah. point of view, when you found out about the, the Canterbury earthquake and then the Christchurch earthquake, what was your immediate reaction? Well, for the um, for the one back in September, I was the uh, the duty seismologist for that one when it happened. Wow. Um, so what that means when um, we have one person who's always on duty 24 hours a day, mm. um, they have a pager with them, and when the system. Um, um, it gets gets um, you know when it Alerts records you. yeah right. it, you know if there is an earthquake uh, somewhere in New Zealand that's mm-hmm. likely that's likely to have been felt it kind of triggers the system and it sets off the pager and the duty seismologist just goes and locates it mm-hmm. um, you know so when the Darfield earthquake happened um, you know kind of the pager went off and then mm-hmm. when I actually went to go locate the data and I could kind of see from all the different instruments that were triggered mm-hmm. and um, how strongly they were triggered basically around the country I knew it was something very very big mm-hmm. for that one. Okay. Um, yeah, so that was my first experience with that, and then, right. uh, um, you know, so that's when you start making the, the, the calls to all the, mm. um, you know, to your boss and managers, and they start gathering people together at mm. uh, at uh, GNS. Um, so that that was because that one occurred, you know, at uh, four thirty mm. on a Saturday morning. Yeah, you know, every, everyone's at home. <laughs> yeah, so you have to. <laughs> so you know, like a lot of phone calls to people's homes and yeah. getting everyone to come to work. Yeah. Um, the Christchurch earthquake, of course, was different because you know it was uh, um, everyone was at work already yeah. at the time when it happened, yeah. um, and I, I wasn't the duty seismologist for that one, no. but um, I um, did a lot of the um, media interviews for that right. um, on that day. Yeah. 
Yeah. When you saw that, well, the first one was a 7.1, personally, what did you think? Gosh, you know, the destruction in Canterbury, I wonder what it's like, you know? Yeah, well, it was kind of hard to say. Um, um, you know, they, my first reaction, actually, because just um, before I even located it, I had, I had sort of a general idea of where it was. Mm. And my first reaction was actually quite a bit of surprise mm. because if it had happened along the Alpine Fault, that's kind of what we had expected. That's right. And we weren't expecting anything, you know, yeah. like that to actually happen um, that close to Christchurch. So there was actually quite a bit of surprise. Mm. And then, um, yeah, and of course, though, being based in Wellington, we had no idea what the that's effect right. on Christchurch was going to be. Yeah. Um, but we knew, you know, of course, that, it w- that, there, that there would be a lot of damage anyways. Did you keep uh, your professional hat on, or did you call friends and family in Christchurch to see um, how they were? No, it? no, you have to keep you, the professional hat yeah. on, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what was the response from GNS? Um, well, the response was, um, you know, that, that day is, again, you know, getting a lot of people together um, to start locating all the aftershocks mm-hmm. and to do all the, to get all the information out to the media so the, the, the general public is informed. And one of the things we did, too, is uh, to organize immediately um, sending teams of people down to, to um, Christchurch to um, survey the, the damage and get an idea of what went on there mm-hmm. and to also deploy a lot of temporary seismometers around to record the aftershocks so mm-hmm. we can get even better, better locations. So um, when the Darfield earthquake happened, um, you know, we had, by the afternoon, we had teams, uh, you know, so that happened Saturday morning. By Saturday afternoon, we had teams of people that were already organized and mm-hmm. starting to make their way down, uh, down to Christchurch with all the equipment that they would need. And then, of course, we had uh, other people going around who were, were mapping the, uh, the fault because, mm-hmm. you know, there was all the, for, the, for Darfield, there was all the surface trace, you know, that mm-hmm. was exposed from that uh, from that earthquake so we had lots of people going out and making detailed maps and for Christchurch um, you know again it was um, very much the same you know teams of people down with the seismometers you know to um, record the aftershocks and uh, people to, you know to inspect the damage and that type of thing. Was this one of your b- the biggest earthquakes you've had to deal with? Um, yes it was um, well probably the biggest one actually was uh, in uh, uh, that we had was 2009, in uh, July 2009 in Fjordland, which right. was actually magnitude 7.8, but two people tend to forget about that one because it didn't really cause much in the way of damage, yeah. but You're right. <laughs> this was off in Fjordland. But, but as far as, um, as being a large earthquake and as far as human impact goes, mm-hmm. and, and in that sense, yes, yeah, this is the biggest. So, and just finally, I mean, this would have been yeah. you know, such a big earthquake, you would have had a lot of media interested in what you had to say about that. How did you cope with that? Is that something you, you're, all, you're trained in or you expect as part of the job? Um, well, we, we do get some media training at GNS, but mostly it's, um, you know, it's just one of these things that you just get, uh, um, you get better at it over yeah, time. The more the you job. talk to the media, yeah, yeah, you just kind of get a bit more experience with it and, uh, yeah, you get and um, yeah with the Darfield one especially, and also with Christchurch, you did get a lot of um, um, overseas media who mm. were interested in you know too. You know, calls from you know like Australia, from Canada, from uh, from from the UK, mm. um, media all over the world were interested in those uh, those earthquakes. I certainly were. Yeah. Well, it's very very interesting what <laughs> you do. Hey, thank you so much for coming okay. on the program. Yeah, you're welcome. My next guest is Anne from the Canterbury District Health Board. Now, Anne, what's your main focus at the moment? Main focus uh, is the winter issues, keeping homes warm to keep people healthy. Um, What's your key message there? Well, the key message is people must use their heating and make sure that they keep um, certain members of the family um, as warm as possible. And we're talking our older people, uh, retired people. In fact, people over the age of about 50, really, Mm. can be um, more vulnerable, and particularly the infants as well. The babies are are not very good at uh, shivering and, you know, their little mechanisms Mm. don't work the same as others. So, yes, keep them warm. And others in the household who have uh, ongoing health issues, maybe heart problems, diabetes and so on, they're the ones. Okay. Hmm. Let's look at some methods that people can keep their homes warm. Well, the number one thing is use your heater. Uh, In spite of the damage to houses, people should use heaters, whatever you've got, um, heat pumps, 
uh, wood burners, whatever you've got. Keep the living room warm, 18 to 21 degrees. Okay. Bedrooms should be kept warm as well. And the World Health Organization says um, 16 degrees uh, would be acceptable. Uh, some people turn the heaters off overnight, but the worry is bedrooms shouldn't be allowed to chill right down. Um, temperatures below 16 start to become a, a bit more of a problem. You must keep the bedroom warm. Okay. Mm. Let's look at ways and we can keep our homes warm or ourselves warm um, when you're sticking to a budget. Because, I mean, there, there are people out there who can't afford to have the heater on all the time. So what other ways can they keep themselves warm? Well, people should dress for the conditions. Um, wear some woolen clothing, you know, merino and whatever. Um, wear a spencer. That's the old-fashioned word, I know. Um, just, yes, wear, wear a few more layers inside, mm. um, and that means that even if the room is a little bit cooler, um, you know, you're not put at risk. So, yes, wear, wear warmer clothing. Okay. So if, um, say, for example, our homes have been damaged in the earthquake, how can we, can we get assistance with this to heat our homes? Yes, people should um, notify um, uh, the Ministry of Social Development or Work and Income mm. and let them know. Um, EQC are still interested in people who um, have damage, particularly to the main source of heaters. Mm. They've done a huge amount of work putting in new heaters to make sure that as many people as possible have suitable heating. There's a lot of heat pumps have gone in and wood burners, but they've got a long way to go. They're doing a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. um, but if people let work and income, their case manager know that um, things are not right and also contact EQC. Okay. Yes, that's... If people are concerned about the cost of heating and things like that, can they get assistance from anywhere? Yes, uh, work and income are very interested to know um, about people having difficulties and they know where to refer from there. Mm. Um, they're the experts in the um, income support issues. Mm. They, they know, uh, lately they know all of the other ways that people can be assisted. There's a number of schemes going on. Okay. Mm. Um, if people are concerned about their health this winter, what should they do? Well, the first thing to do is see your doctor. Some people may think the house is causing the problem because of damage, but uh, that's difficult to prove. But the doctor knows um, they will look at the health issue and they may be able to refer that family into um, programs, including the Warm Families program, which okay. the GPs already know about and the practice nurses. It's a scheme run through doctors. And that's the scheme where they actually deal with the insulation issues. Okay. That's the main thing they deal with, improving the insulation. Right. So that is actually a big question too. Mm. All right. So mm. let's just recap on the um, how we can keep our and our homes warm this winter. Keep the heaters on, dress warmly in the house um, and also you know make sure that your curtains are okay, check around for that. We also want people just to make sure things don't get too damp. Mm -hmm. Dampness um, is not good mm. so um, they need to kind of do a bit of ventilating of the house on the sunny days. So okay. just keep warm and dry, keep the heaters on, don't worry about uh, and worried about the power bills, they need to actually alert work and income. Okay. Sometimes family members might be able to step in and help there too. All right. And you've given yeah. me a home energy advice line number. Yes, that's a very good organisation locally where they can problem solve household by household the little ways of how to make your budget work around heating. They, they know so much and they're a wonderful asset in the city. Okay. Yes. So it's 0800 388 588. That's right. 0800 388 588. And that's the organisation Community Energy Action a lot of people know about them. Yes, yes we had Bede on the programme last yes. week. Good to yes. have him here. Yeah. And thank you for coming on the programme today. Pleasure. And after this break, we talk to the Electoral Commission.
welcome back to City Life. It's getting to that time of year again when political parties are gearing themselves up for the next election. There's a lot to do before November comes about. Murray, what does your job involve? My job involves getting everybody on the electoral roll and making sure that they're accurately on the electoral roll and that people who aren't enrolled currently get a form, fill it in and are ready for, to vote. How can we check to see if we are already on the electoral roll? From today, uh, we're sending out enrolment update packs to everybody who's currently enrolled. Mm -hmm. So by Wednesday, uh, post it for three days to deliver those. So by Wednesday afternoon, if you haven't received one, you're not currently enrolled. And we'll be doing some advertising for our free phone service, free text, internet, and you also you can pop down to a post shop and get an enrolment form there. Is the little orange man part of the uh, part of the role this year? The orange guy is. <laughs> yeah, the orange guy. <laughs> but we've simplified all the adverts. Uh, they're, they're a lot more simpler. We're using icons and um, you would have seen them by now. So does he, does he work as part of the, um, the you know, advertising the, ele the elections? Oh, he works very hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got to inform everybody about the elections. Mm. And this year as well, there's a referendum on our voting system. So it's not only the, the general election, but the referendum as well. So Orange Guy has got a lot of work to do to explain the, the election, the referendum and all the voting options. Yeah, he's pretty good at it, isn't he? Sure is. <laughs> So what happens with people in Christchurch? You must have a different sort of strategy for Christchurch at the moment. Yeah, year. Christchurch is a challenge. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of things on this year, too, of course. There's the recovery that's happening in Christchurch, which will be exercising all locals' minds. Mm. But there's also that Rugby World Cup, and that will uh, t be a lot of attention being focused on that. Mm. Um, we've got to get through that clutter. But the, the first thing for Christchurch people is that uh, there's a particular part in the legislation, and I don't want to bore people by getting into legislation. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it says um, that you reside at the place where you make your home. Mm -hmm. And it also says that just because you're occasionally absent from that home, it doesn't change the fact that that's still where you reside and you enrol there. Okay. So putting that to the practical part of where, uh, for Christchurch, mm. people have been displaced. Mm. If that is still classed as their home, they intend to go back there one day when it's uh, rebuilt or rebuild there, mm. they should remain enrolled there. What we'd like them to do, though, on their enrolment form when they get it, is put their current address as their mailing address, and that ah. way we can keep in touch with them. Ah, that's a good way. Mm. Is it um, by law we have to be enrolled? It is. Yeah. Uh, it's compulsory enrolment uh, mm. in New Zealand, uh, but it's not compulsory to vote. Okay, that's interesting, isn't it? So what are the main points you want to make this year for people with the, the packs coming out? What are the main points for this week? Uh, the packs are coming out this week. Yeah. If you haven't got one by Wednesday, you're not enrolled, so you need to get an enrolment form. Okay. If you do get it, open it, check your details. Mm -hmm. If they're correct, that's fine. Yeah, you, not, you do nothing else. You can you sit tight, you're ready to vote. Okay. Uh, if they do need me to make an amendment, do so, send it back to us straight away. And it'd be good to get them back straight away as well, and then you know that it's done, and you can yeah. start watching the World Cup and not worry about your enrolment details. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The other thing I'd like to, if you get packs for people that are no longer at your residence, send them back to us because we'll take their names off the roll. They're no longer eligible to be enrolled there. Okay, that's good. So by Wednesday, if we haven't got our packs, we should call you? Yep. on the internet? Give us a call, uh, 0800 36 76 56. Mm -hmm. If you haven't got a pack or even you know now that you're not enrolled, mm. you can free text 3676, put your name and address in it, okay. the text message, and we'll send a pack out online at elections.org.nz. And there's all the information there. You can actually enrol online, uh, put in all your details. You can then hit the submit button and we'll post the form out to you for signing. Otherwise, you can download it, sign it, post it, scan it and email it to us. There's a whole lot of options there to, to get enrolled. So it's really easy. Oh, great. Murray, we all have to have our own election day, don't we, really? Sure do. <laughs> and as I say, there's a referendum as well, and that's mm. important the way we're going to uh, vote in the future. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the programme, and we'll um, definitely check out the orange guy. Pleasure. For his busy, busy work and his job. After the break, Spates Coast to Coast's Robin Judkins. Welcome back. It's the endurance event that's tackled only by the strong in body and mind. And Robin, you did it yourself this year, right? Oh, uh, yeah, the Spades Coast to Coast. Yeah. This year was the 29th year, and uh, I decided to do it myself last year in June when I broke my leg. I know. So 
uh, six weeks after uh, uh, the break, yeah. I got my plaster off and I took to the mountains, took the hills, yeah. and in, um, and um, seven months later, I did the Space Coast to Coast as a team with Steve Gurney, and you, it was absolutely fantastic. You are amazing. Now, you've got a documentary coming out. Yes, Tell me it's, about uh, this. Uh, well, last year we were asked to, every year I produce a documentary, but last year uh, Eurosport, which is a, a big uh, channel in, in Europe, mm. asked us to provide a 50-minute documentary, which which uh, I did, yeah. of this year's race. And the quality was so good, mm. um, they wanted it in high definition. Mm. So um, uh, three weeks ago I, um, I tried it out in a cinema in Auckland, mm. and it was so spectacular that I decided to release it first in in New Zealand in cinemas. So I started last Monday yeah. in Whangarei and wow. I've made my way around the North Island and I'm down back into the South Island. I'm doing a, a theatre every night in a different city. Oh. It has been outrageous. We have full houses every night Amazing. and um, it, it's quite a knockout. You've turned multi-sport people into camera mm. people. How did you do that? Well, traditionally, we've always used film people for the event. Mm. But um, I wanted to get into the heart of the event, which mm. was in the mountain section and in the river. And the only way you can do that is to use people who are very good at those things. Yeah. So we trained up a whole lot of um, former um, multi-sporters into mm. camera people, well, both men and, and women. Yeah. And then we put them, inserted them into the race. Yeah. So they're in the cycling sections, they're in the mountain running sections, and they're in the river. And consequently, the, the footage that we got was spectacular. Absolutely fantastic. Now, it's becoming an internet success as well, isn't it? It's yeah. been a knockout. Yeah. Four years ago, I decided to devote the, 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 the money that I normally put aside for television production, I'll put it into the internet. So that's why I trained up these multi-sporters. Mm. We started off the first year, we went with a, a li some, pe some live pieces, some pre-recorded and post-recorded material, and we went out. Um, unfortunately, our server failed oh. after half a day, oh. and we'd got one and a half million hits. The oh. following year, we served it out of America, and we got 11.4 million hits. Last year, we got 14.1 million hits. It is mind-boggling. Oh, my gosh. And because of that... Uh, the numbers of internationals in the event mm. have risen so dramatically that they are now second only to Canterbury as a region. Oh, it's gosh. fantastic. And this year, um, or rather next year, mm. 2012, will be the 30th anniversary of the race, mm. and I expect that internationals will exceed all, our, all other regions, including Canterbury. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's been about 70 um, television docos on mm -hmm. the coast to coast. How different is this one? Well, this one follows. Uh, this one is really different because mm. it's got so much about the mountain running section and the river section. Okay. It covers it much, much better than has ever been done before. Mm -hmm. That's the significant difference. Okay, and um, so now is a pretty good time for people to start training for the Space Coast. Oh, Coast. absolutely, because yeah. the entries have just opened as well, mm. and we're looking for a bumper field. Eight hundred is the max that I'm allowed to uh, have in the race. Okay, looking for that uh, for next February. Robin, you're a good man. Okay, Christchurch, Monday, June twentieth, seven p.m. and eight fifteen p.m. Hollywood Cinema. That's your cinema, right? Yeah, yeah. Sumner <laughs> Cinema. Like, big yeah. cinema too. Yeah. Doing two shows, one after the other, and actually I'm going to schedule a third show because oh, yeah. in Auckland I did three consecutive shows at the Rialto and Newmarket and they were all pre-sold. Everything was sold out in advance. It was extraordinary. I mean, New Zealanders like to watch New Zealand stuff. They do. But this is the first time that a New Zealand sports event, mm. has, a documentary of it, has ever been shown in cinemas around New Zealand. So wow. this is brand new territory, and people are coming out to see it. June 20th, and we can pick our tickets up at coasttocoast.co.nz? No, you just turn up on the day. Turn it's up. first in, first served. It All was right. fantastic All right. in Auckland. The, <laughs> cinema, the foyer was absolutely <clears throat> chocker with people. <laughs> but yeah, it always Get there early, good. then. Create a crowd. Yeah. Sell more soft drinks. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming to the program. Oh, Now I'd like to welcome and speak to Dave Laurie to City Life. Welcome. It's good Thank to you. have you here. Good to be here. Now the area that you look after, that's been quite hard hit by the earthquake. What's, what's happening out there? It's actually quite interesting. I mean, for a lot of people, the first earthquake was the major one. Mm. Um, Rangiora is not affected too badly, but Kaiapoi, Spencerville, um, out the Pines Beach, those areas, have got really significant damage from the first earthquake. So for some people, the second earthquake's a lot less of importance to them in fact, I've been talking to about probably 30 or 40 people out there. And over, as time's gone on, mm. it's been the lack of activity that they've begun to get concerned about. But just in the last few weeks in Courtney Downs, 
there seems to be some real movement in terms of houses coming down and some work being done. So, okay. there's interesting stories there, though. Lots of interesting stories from people over there. People yeah. meeting each other and talking to each other. And f- yeah. in fact, some goods come out of this issues. Obviously, a lot of harm, but some mm. good. You know, communities really talking and helping each other, and mm. so it's not all bad. So, how important is it for communities to get together, not just at this time, but mm. you know, from here on in? Well, I think it's really critical. I mean, in terms of people getting well too, like. Pre September, we might say, How are you feeling? and say, oh, Okay. Mm. But if you say now, Well, actually, you're not really okay, are you? Mm. Then the stories come out. And I really defy most of us to be really okay after what we've been through. Mm. So, a lot of issues. So, I think one of the real healing tools is to talk to each other and maybe not be the nosy neighbour, but be the caring neighbour. Mm. So, if you identify a person that's up the road and maybe alone or vulnerable or not coping, mm. We need to know those things, not, or someone needs to know, not just yeah. necessarily police, but you know, get the message out so help can come. And police will be patrolling. We're patrolling much more than we ever had. Mm. So that's probably another message. Bad time to be a criminal at the moment. Mm. Don't start your career at the moment because mm. we've never been more up and running in terms of staff and um, reassurance patrols. And so the key message really is if you see something, 111, we do want to hear about it. Yeah. Don't worry about sensory numbers. Ring us mm. because, frankly, we've got more staff capable of responding than ever, and we're actually really geared up to, to sort these things out. What are the issues for police in your area at the moment, in the northern area? Um, there's a number of issues. We've, first, first issue really is probably the spread of the CBD into Papua Nui and some right. of our areas. For mm. example, there were a number of buildings that hadn't been occupied for probably a year and a half in Papua Nui. Mm. Well, basically everything's leased. Mm. The IRD call centre is about 200 staff have now moved in. We've got a new antique shop, a whole range of shops. Mm. And that brings with it other customers, um, which is really good. I mean, if you talk to the actual owners, a lot of them are significantly up in their takings. Mm. So Papua is now a vibrant little place. But we've also got a few bars opening, and that in itself is not bad. It's just that sometimes it attracts predators um, into the areas. So what we're doing at the moment, in fact, I was before the council um, yesterday asking for a liquor ban around Papua Nui mm. and Merivale. Mm. And the story there is, is that Liquor bans themselves aren't panaceas for stolen crime, but they give us an opportunity to talk to offenders who are carrying alcohol and basically get them out of the area or suggest better behaviours before we get bad offending like serious mm. assaults or maybe predator rapes and this sort of thing. Right. And I think that's one of the messages too. Mm. As we change our drinking um, ideas into the suburbs, mm. people need to take a little bit more care. I mean, previously you might have wandered down to your local bar and wandered home. Mm. Just be aware now there might be a new set of clientele and offenders coming into your area mm. to predate. So that's, without frightening people, it's mm. just making some extra precautions. Is that an issue in the northern area at the moment? Um, yes, we've had a situation in Jelly Park, for example, where some of our sexual offenders have sort of moved in there. We've got schools nearby that are doubling up. Mm-hmm. And um, we've caught some offenders. We're doing some training, for example, with the, um, the pool area there right. so that they keep an eye on who yeah. isn't coming. I mean, if a chap is in the training rooms for 10 hours, might be suspicious, maybe. These sort of things. So, mm. But once again, not trying to frighten people, mm. we've had some really good changes. Like One of the real positive things, I think, is the schools being together. Like mm. Some schools are now cohabitating mm-hmm. with each other, yeah. really getting on well, and it's a real challenge for the youth. And I think one of the real positive stories out of what's happened is how the youth have really picked up. I mean, getting into town and helping. I mean, I think Canterbury youth sometimes get a bit of a bad rap meter-wise, mm. but I'd like to think that they're doing a really fantastic job of the youth and... Most of the ones that I've seen around town are fantastic people and doing well. Now, the, you, there was a liquor ban in the Rickerton area, and that seems to be working. So you're hoping to bring one into Papua Nui? Funny enough, there's always already been one, in, a permanent liquor ban in Papua Nui for mm. years, and that oh, was yeah. to target the mall. Right. But it achieved its goal, which was to reduce drinking around the mall area. Yeah. And it almost become, it was in existence, but didn't need to be policed too much. Mm. But now we've got a couple of new bars arriving and um, we are concerned. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to predict this. Mm. So what we're trying to do is to get these bans in place early mm. to prevent the victimisation. And that's mm. the key. If we can prevent things occurring yeah. based on our previous knowledge, and then we can actually have a real inroad into reducing overall crime. So when will we know if this has um, come, come about? Well, it's working its way to the council, as I say. I went okay. and talked to the mayor and his team yesterday. and. Yeah. I'm hopeful that it will come in pretty quickly. I mean, they also realise the pragmatic approach. We don't need to have hundreds of stats on victims that have been victimised. Mm. Let's make a decision based on past history and actually do it before people are victimised.
makes sense. Yeah. Now, part of your area is North Canterbury. Yep. Um, people from Christchurch have, uh, you know, displaced, are displaced, and have gone into sort of the Rangiora area. What are the crime stats in Rangiora the, at the moment? How are they looking? Well, actually, overall crime um, is way down. Okay. So, um, uh, from a district point of view, we're about 37% down on crime. OK. Um, there are some little areas where we've got concerns. Mm. And I think also it's fair to say, like I said before, we're policing fairly hard with extra staff. Mm. So we're out and about, and that is definitely um, preventing crime. Mm. And when you say North Canterbury, it's not just actually Rangiora. There's actually things like Calverton, 60 new pupils in Calverton School. Mm. Hamna, mm. you know, really buzzing like mad, 10,000 people on the weekends. Sort of thing. So people have actually gone much further afield. Wow. So that has brought some issues, like, for mm. example, in Rangiora, some people have sort of said, well, what's happened to our little town? Mm. There's now a half-hour wait in the, in the new world and this sort of thing, which, and there's congestion on the roads. And <laughs> so there's those sort of things, but it'll all pan out. But overall, crime-wise, uh, it's not, there's no blowout of crime. In fact, there's a reduction. Okay. However, there are some, like I said, some issues. Now, family violence is a... We know from overseas history with disasters that, in fact, um, over time you can get a spike in family violence as people who are stressed make bad decisions. Mm. And at the moment, you've got people you might love but not like too much mm. living with you, you know what I mean, because mm. of displacement. Mm. That can actually result in um, stresses in the house. So we're gearing up for that. And we, without a huge increase in numbers, we are seeing a little bit of an increase in the nastiness of violence. Right. So those that were already um, maybe in a dysfunctional or problematic relationship, mm. losing the plot a bit harder and actually causing more damage. And what we're doing to prevent that is actually we're doing some cold calling, which is a bit unusual. Wow. So what we do is we rock up, knock on the door, hello, mm. Mr and Mrs Bloggs. You've had a problem in the past. Mm. We're well aware of it. Mm -hmm. You may. What are your circumstances now? How's it going? We're not going to be accepting of any sort of leniency around violence. Mm. I won't say kick the cat because some animal rights will be at me, but don't kick the wife, all right? Mm. Go for a walk. Get, it, get your violence out in a different way. Mm. If you need assistance, here's some ideas that you may get assistance from, this sort of talk, okay. which is a bit unusual. You get interesting yeah. reactions that way. Yeah, you're arriving. Going? Well, it's actually quite interesting. It's um, everything from uh, out of here, please, to mm. actually please the, that you care. And yeah. I think the please that you care is coming through quite strongly, especially from the victims. Mm. And so that's really quite powerful. Yeah, all right. Mm. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on the programme. It's good to hear about your area. We'll catch up with you in a couple of weeks to see how it's going. Nice. That's all right? All right. All done. Thank you. Um, and we'll be back after this break. Welcome back. We have John from Rialto with us. Welcome. Um, good morning. How are you, Kenita? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It's good to see you. Wake up! <laughs> no, 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 no. Just, um, yeah, what you were talking about before. Hey, what are we talking deodorant. about? We're, no, you're deodorant, right. Well, we're talking about movies, not deodorant, aren't yeah. we? So this week, Rialto Cinemas are going to be screening a movie called Barney's Version. And Barney's version features uh, great performances from Paul Giamatti. People will remember him from Sideways or The Last Station. We've got Dustin Hoffman in it. Uh, Barney is an ageing television producer, so quite apt. Uh, divorced, comforted by his cigars and his drinking habits, and he starts to reflect on his sort of life's demeanours. So should we cut to the trailer? Yeah, let's do it. As for you, I even signed it. You screwed over everyone you ever knew or cared about. Now the whole world's gonna know what a murderer you really are. You could use a mint. Barney Bonofsky. 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 It's fine. Got her pregnant, man. Mazel tov. How do you even know it's yours? Well, I'm the father. Then you must be an albino. She's a well-bred woman, makes a nice like a kugel, has a beautiful rack. Many successful marriages have been built on far less. Hi. I'm sorry, we haven't met. I'm Barney. I'm Miriam. Are you doing anything later? Because we could still catch a flight to Rome. The bride may take issue with that. We put that out. Yeah. A lot of my relatives have asthma. Don't be ridiculous. We just met at your wedding. <laughs> it's not funny. For the first time in my life, I am truly seriously in love. So am I, Barney. So am I. And is she the one? Is she the mother of your children? Absolutely. All right, then, let's do it. 
don't know where to start with how inappropriate this all is. Why don't you just skip ahead from where I'm annoying and inappropriate to where I'm charming and endearing? Salute. Salute. That was my first gun. I want you to have it. Ah! I should kill you for this. What you should have done was call first. How come you didn't mention this gun? I'm just going to keep talking because I'm afraid that if I stop, there's going to be a pause and you're going to say I should get going. There it was, the pause. I'm still here. So this one's showing on Wednesday, is it? Yes, this one is showing on Wednesday night uh, at our Art House Lecture Theatre at Lincoln U- University. Now, if people want to sh- uh, sort of find out what's going on, what Rialto are doing, where we're playing movies, etc., they can phone our movie information line, which is 374-9404, or they can go to the Lincoln website, which is www.lincoln.ac.nz slash films on campus. Now, tickets are really cheap. Oh, good. Yeah. How much are they? Oh, $7 for students or seniors. Is eight dollars for adults, oh and gosh. we're showing new release movies, so it's well worth the trip. Great. So, how's it going out there at Lincoln? I mean, I know that because you can't get into Rialto, you are at Lincoln University. Yes. How's it going? It's going all right. Yeah. We're sort of we're getting audiences anywhere between sixty to a hundred. Mm. The uh, theatre seats three hundred, so we've got plenty of seats for. Okay. Yeah. What other movies coming out this week? Well, we've got The Hangover 2, because yeah. we, we were going to trailer that, but uh, Bunnies came along. So The Hangover 2, now this takes, um, sort, of, we've, sort of follows on from the previous um, Hangover movie, where the bachelor party was in Las Vegas, where the boys then go for um, Stu's wedding, and Stu decides they're going to go to Thailand, and... Uh, they're going to have a wedding brunch. However, things go seriously awry from there on. Mm. Uh, this stars Bradley Cooper, Ed Helms, and Zach Galifianakis again. Yeah. And there's a fantastic uh, cameo performance from Ken Jeong as Mr. Chow. So look out <laughs> for that. That'll be very, very funny. I mean, if anybody saw Hangover, they yeah. w- are we going to love Hangover 2? Oh, this is going to be riotous. Really? It is going to be so funny. Oh, I love I'm going those to see movies. It. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to see it as well. What else have we got coming out? Well, coming out. Next week, we've got X-Men First Class. Now, this charts the beginning of the X-Men um, okay. for the Marvel comics. Right. So that'll be, yeah. <laughs> that sounds super that exciting. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. I can hardly wait. Do you love X-Men? Uh, I, uh, I would have to confess not to sing any of the okay. X-Men movies. Yeah, yeah I, I'm yeah. going to confess as well. Right. Yeah. But we had to put it in there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anything else? Anything for the ladies? I suppose Hangover 2 could be for the ladies. Hangover 2? Yeah, why not? I'm dragging my wife along to see it. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Um, what else is happening out at, um, well, in the cinema world? What, what um, cinemas are open at the moment? Well, of course, we've got the Hoyt Cinemas, mm. Rickerton and Northlands. We've got Sumner, the theatre out there. Um, and we've got Cinema 3 out at Hornby. Okay. Yeah. And just tell me one more time, where can we pick up the tickets for Rialto for Wednesday? Well, come along to the uh, to the theatre out at, the Stewart Theatre out at Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Ticket sales in the door, cash sales only, I'm afraid. Uh, we're sort of operating very, uh, very sort of, I'm lost for words. I'm lost for words. <laughs> We're all lost for words. Yeah. Yeah. John, thank you so much for coming on the program, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, Kenita. Bye. Five city councillors went to San Francisco to see how they coped in the aftermath of their big earthquake, and Aaron is here to tell us all about it. How did the trip go? Oh, fantastic, actually. The... Uh the San Francisco City Council really turned it on and, and brought in guests not just from San Fran because their earthquake wasn't as bad as ours. Mm. If you're not sure if you're aware, and it happened slightly out of San Francisco as well, down to um, Palo Alto. But they brought in people from New Orleans that are doing Hurricane Katrina. They brought in people from Harvard University who are some of the world's uh, you know, best minds in earthquake, uh, well, disaster recovery, really. Mm. Yeah. What sort of things did you learn there? Oh, wow. Well, probably the, the main lesson is that in the recovery process, because we're out of the emergency now, we've got, we're heading into recovery, mm. and the best part of the recovery is done, or the best practice globally is when you involve local business and business leaders as well as the council and community groups. At the moment, it seems it's council, government, community groups, mm. but the business leaders have been left out, and that was probably the main lesson, is that all the really successful ones, mm. that's been the case. Where that hasn't happened, it's been really unsuccessful. 
Because you did have a, a group of five or six business people who went with you. Yeah. Um, and did they? Did you all stay together, or did you go off and do your different? No, we all did stay together. Uh, and I chose the accommodation. I'm real cheap as well, so some of them were a bit, <laughs> a bit stunned. Uh, but well, it, well, it's not a cheap city. San mm. Francisco is a really expensive city, even though it's one of the most as far as earthquakes go, one of the most dangerous cities in, in America. Mm. Uh, people still gravitate towards there, and of course Silicon Valley's there, and some of the richest people in, in the world live there. Mm. Uh, Larry Ellis is there, they're about to have the America's Cup. So it's a very interesting city, but people gravitate towards it, and I see Christchurch like that as well. It's a city that people gravitate towards, and it's really creative. Now, you went over there with ideas in mind, I assume, about what you wanted to get out of it. Did you, what were the ideas you went over with, and did you get out of it what you wanted to get out of it? Well, Bob had sent us over to really research urban design. He really wanted us to look at uh, the, the working form of a city, the public transport, those kind of things, uh, the design for us, because we're deciding on that going forward. But it was a case of once we'd got hold of the staff there, they'd kind of... Add, taken that but added so much more to it so we did we had days with the USGS we met the Chamber of Commerce we so there were so many extra things because they knew what we needed more than we knew mm. but what they were really impressed about is 90 days after our event we had taken a delegation of councillors and business people mm. uh, over there to find out how to get it right mm. and so they said that normally people don't do that in mm. general disasters you spend your first year or two years uh, floundering round, mm. and then kind of go, man, we should get some information on this and work out what we're doing. Mm. Whereas they said they were quite blown away that we'd decided to do it so early before we uh, made any decisions. And it was mm. good to learn what they'd done wrong as well as what they'd done right. Right, yeah. But, I mean, I have a feeling it was your initiative actually to go over there. Yeah, Is that it was, right? Yeah. yeah. Why was it so important for you to go over there with other councillors and a business delegation to San Francisco? For, for those reasons to find out because I always thought that looking at global events that San Francisco had always got it right mm. they were one of the ones uh, so I thought well there's no better way than when you're actually somewhere you can see, smell, feel, touch a place mm. that gives you way more information than the internet ever can or, mm. or, or looking at people doing um, you know uh, lectures over the telephone it's just, it's just not the same and our workload there was massive mm, it was, was it? really really massive yeah yeah because you were there for one week yeah one week you've been back for one week what have yeah, you done almost. in the week since you've been back uh, well, we've had council meetings, had a full council meeting yesterday, which was quite a long one, and had uh, breakdowns with the um, with the key staff and things. Uh, I've br already started to instigate some ideas. I had a health board meeting as well, because I'm on the health board, mm -hmm. and they're taking the same ideas to them. One of the big problems following disasters is that you lose staff. Christchurch companies, organisations are going to lose tons of staff, and we had... Uh, we were talking yesterday about our CEO's job and role in the in the council, mm. and there was a guy there from a, um, a, a human resource company, and he was saying that there's, their company's really trying to fill five or six roles at the moment, big roles mm. in Christchurch, because mm. people have just left. Mm. They just get to one day, and they just hand in their notice that day, mm. and they're gone. And these aren't people on 12 bucks an hour. These mm. are people on massive salaries, wow. whose families and wives, and that, they've moved here, they've been here a few years, and their wives and that are just going, or husbands are going, no way, we're not living here anymore, this wow. is horrid. And so they just leave town. Mm. And so it's not just people at the bottom end that are doing that, it's right through. So every organisation is going to lose key personnel. So mm. I've come back with some ideas on how to change that and right. hopefully revolutionise our employment practices mm -hmm. um, in Christchurch. And uh, council's looking at that, so Bob and Tony were really open to those ideas as mm. well as the uh, health board and hopefully it'll spread. It's not going to be a, fi a quick fix though, is it? No, it's not. But if we can provide a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, it will get people excited. And that's why I was gutted we lost the Rugby World Cup, because mm. that was something they'd done in um, San Francisco in 1906, which was probably the world's worst ever earthquake for an urban area. And mm. they decided to get the World's Fair. They held the World's Fair 10 years later. So they didn't only say we're going to rebuild the city, and they didn't only say we're going to build the most impressive city hall probably in the world. Mm. Uh, it's this massive granite building, which is just sensational, bigger than Capitol Hill in wow. Washington, D.C. Really? So there are a lot of egos, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but they, uh, and then it, they just retrofit it recently, so it's earthquake-proof, and they spent $300 million doing that. 
Um, but they had the world's fear as well because they wanted to say to the whole world, we're open for business. We've come through this. We're a better city now than we were before. So I think Christchurch is going to need an event like that. Mm. I think we have to have something to aim towards. And the Rugby World Cup would have been that, but probably in too, too soon, short yeah, too short a period mm. to have pulled it off. It would have been better to have had the final here, but it had been four years away or five years away. That would have been the better scenario. Mm. But okay. All right, well, um, we do have to wrap it up here, but um, I did ta- um, have a quick look at the vehicles in the car park outside, and I see a big van out there. Yep. Now, in a former life, I knew you because we used to sing and form yes. together, but um, you're still doing it. Yeah, yeah, so no, I'm still, still, still entertaining. Uh, yeah. I've got a, a dinner theatre restaurant called the Murder Mystery Dinner Theatre, yeah. and it's, where, uh, it's like a comedy show, because I'm actually a comedian, and the Americans yeah, found yeah. that pretty funny. <laughs> And uh, they, uh, and so it's, people come along, they try and solve a murder and go through a comedy show. And we also have the world's longest haunted tram ride, so they get chased really? by zombies. And is it a fact the world's longest haunted tram ride? Well, that's what we say, but we can't find it. <laughs> well, we've looked on the internet, which is always true, and we can't find Google anywhere it. that's got one longer. Oh. So we're going to apply to Guinness. We would have done it by now, but the earthquakes have upset things right. a little. Right. Okay. So, so um, that's coming up. Uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. winter season's just started, so it, it's uh, it's looking pretty busy again. Um, so. How do we get our tickets? Um, people just we well, can go to dinnertheatre.co.nz or give us a call on three five nine nine five five six. Oh, like, we're going to remember that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but it's the murder mystery dinner theatre. There's signs around town. I know, I've seen them. Yeah. I actually really like a good sort of murder mystery. So yeah, good. come <laughs> hey, along. Hey, thanks for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. That is City Life for today. Don't forget, we've got some tickets to give away for the importance of being earnest and also Vegas. So you can email me, kineta at ctv.co.nz. You can give us, give us a call, 377033, or you can write to us, PO Box 1100 Christchurch. Thanks for watching.